Hey, what's going on? So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about my snowplow contracts for the 2022-2023 season. Um, I updated my contracts a little bit from last year, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the updates. If you haven't seen last year's video, I'll put a link for that down in the video description, as well as a card up top. I think it's on this side over here. So you can click on that and check out last year's video. Now, the one main change that I did for this year was I eliminated per time contracts. So I'm only doing seasonal contracts. Um, I've just found that over the years that the seasonal contracts basically are the only thing that gets me through the season and the per time contracts just it's really not enough to cover all of the actual expenses for the year. So I also include a cover letter every year when I send out my contracts. Um, this year it was way more in depth than it usually is because I explained why I changed from per time to seasonal and I explained a little bit about like all of the expenses of the business and why it's um, so expensive and I had to raise some of my prices and stuff like that. So if you're interested in getting a copy of my plow contract or my cover letter, if you have any questions about any of this kind of stuff, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll put that down in the video description as well. All right, so here's my plow contract for this year. I use Google Docs to do this. Uh, it's free and it's easy to use. So I highly recommend using Google Docs. So I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see this a little better. All right. All right, so right at the top, I put all my company information, which I just made blank so that I can share this file if anybody's interested. And I show the plowing coverage dates right here. I do November 1st through April 30th. Uh, last year, I shortened it to April 15th, but we actually got a snowfall in May and I ended up having to plow once in May. We got like six inches. So I extended it back to April 30th. Just it's an even six months that way. It was just easier for me to do it that way. Then to put the customer information, I send this out blank and I have them fill it out. That's why it's in a red box. Um, I try to put red anywhere that I need them to actually do something. So I've had people send these back completely blank before and I've done highlighting and red and boxes. I've tried everything and people inevitably send stuff back blank. <laughs> So then I come down here, I fill in their seasonal price. And in New York State, we have sales tax because this is a service. So then the total price. And then I give the option of one or two payments. Because I'm not doing per time anymore, I did give this other option right here. Um, so if somebody really needs to split it up into four payments or if they want to do it monthly over the six months, I could do that. The reason I didn't add that on this page was I just didn't want to have six different options. I just, I didn't want to make it too complicated. I wanted to give either one or two payments and then under special circumstances for certain people, we can do more payments. Next section, I talk about the payment options, cash, don't send cash in the mail, obviously contact me to arrange a payment uh, and asking people to send back a signed copy. The check, if you're going to send a check, you just choose your payment plan above and send the amount from your payment plan along with one copy. If you're doing an electronic payment, don't send the payment. I'll just send back the contract and then I'll email you an invoice. So then when I send that invoice, it gives you the option to pay with credit card, debit card, direct bank transfer, um, as well as Apple Pay. Um, if they wanted to do it in person, I could, I have got a card reader that will take Google Pay too, but it doesn't do that through my invoicing. Then I also give the option of Venmo and PayPal because I do have a few customers who um, pay with both of those things that want to pay that way. So I give that option to everybody. So I go down to my terms and conditions. I just talk about past due payments. So if people don't pay by the due date, even though on my contracts, they all state that it's due upon receipt, which means basically when you get this invoice, pay it. Uh, some people don't pay within 30 days. Basically it's due upon receipt. And after 30 days, it becomes late. And then I tack on late fees. So that explains that. Then I talk about the fact that we're agreeing on this based on the customer's driveway as it is. So if I see it and then like next week they have a driveway installed uh, off the side or parking areas, it's not included in my price. Uh, return check fee right here. Banks usually charge about $20 and then I tack on an extra $10 because there's an inconvenience. I get charged a fee by the bank. Um, I have to send out a new bill. It's just complicated for everybody. So I upcharge the bank's fee to make it. It's not worth my while, even at the extra $10, but at least I'm getting something for that. Then there's just this legal thing about uh, if we have to go to court and who's responsible for the costs. 
Then I talk about the trigger depth. I plow when there's approximately two inches or more. Um, I used to have a clause in here that said I will try to get everybody done by 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., but I just didn't want to lock myself into times. Um, I just try to get it done as soon as I can, but not everybody works, so not everybody has to be done by 7. And then I've got customers who I don't have to get done by 7. They have to be done by like 10. So it was just like was too complicated for me to put a time in there and then have to tweak every contract. So I just didn't add that in. This is a new line item this year. Um, I've always done this, but I've never really put it in my contract. In the fall, I go around when I put the stakes in because I include driveway marker stakes, which we'll get to next. But when I do that, I bring a hedge trimmer and I like clean up if any trees or shrubs are coming in on the driveway so I don't scratch my plow and my truck. This next line talks about marker stakes. So I purchase, install, and remove marker stakes. I've always done that. Uh, I don't want to cause any damage to people's property. So it's, and I don't trust where people put them. It's much easier for me to install them versus relying on people to do it. And not everybody would do it or they wouldn't do it till after it snowed. You know what I mean? So it's just easier for me to install them and be responsible for them completely. I had this line in here before saying don't remove them because they're my property, but uh, I added this line in removal of the stakes may result in damage to property because I had somebody remove them last year before the season was over and I caused pretty, I caused some pretty bad damage to their lawn, but it wasn't in my contract that if they removed them, it was their responsibility. So I had to add this in to try to cover my bases so that you know, I cleaned it up in the spring because I do spring cleanup, but I couldn't like say like, well, you took them out, so I'm charging you for it. So I'm just trying to cover all my bases here. Next line, spring cleanup. I include spring cleanup in my price. So if I do any lawn damage, um, if they have a gravel driveway and the gravel gets in the lawn, I get rid of that all out. We rake it out. Um, I actually bought a paddle broom last year or a paddle sweep, I think it's called which uh, I did some videos on. If you're interested in that, I'll put a link for down in the description of the video of the paddle broom. That thing is amazing. Uh, here I just state that I will stay 12 inches away from vehicles and obstructions because I don't want to, I don't want to get too close and hit something. So I also want to have it in my contract so that people are like, well, you don't get close enough to the whatever. Like, yeah, I don't want to hit stuff. It also talks about um, if there's like any dips in the drive or whatever. Like I've got one driveway in particular where in where the tires have driven for the entire age of the house over this driveway it's super depressed and then goes up in the middle again so when i plow it it always leaves snow there so there's just a line in there that talks about the fact that if there's any depressions or stuff like that um, my plow won't remove it also if people drive over the fresh snow a bunch before i've plowed it that it can pack down and basically i won't be able to remove it and then the last thing on page one is just that I will do one swipe in front of the mailbox. I know not all plow guys do that. Um, I know that because I drive past and I see people's mailboxes who are not plowed out, but their driveway is. So it's one thing that I do because people hire me to plow. They probably don't want to or can't physically shovel in front of their mailbox. And they won't deliver mail if it's not accessible easily. So... I just make sure that's always cleared out for them. Hey, if you're getting anything of value out of this, go down below and click the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. And when you subscribe, click the little notification bell right next to the subscribe button. Turn that to all. That way you can be notified when I release new videos. All right, on to page two. I talk about salting, sanding, and shoveling are not included in the contract unless specified in the additional notes section. Services may be slippery after plowing and contractor assumes no liability for such instances. Now, obviously, People want to sue you, people are going to sue you, but this just puts in there that I'm not responsible for that kind of stuff. I do shovel for a handful of people, so on their contracts, what I do is I cross out the word shoveling and I initial it, and then in the additional notes section, I write in exactly what I shovel for them, just so that it's added into the contract. Next thing, if snow banks or snow totals exceed the amount that can be managed by a snowplow, there may be a need for additional heavy equipment. This is not included in the price. It will be billed separately, and it's up to me to determine when I have to do that. So, um, I haven't had to do this yet, but we have pretty big storms here. I live in upstate New York, and we can get feet of snow in a storm. And if that happens late in the season and the snowbanks are already really big, then you don't have anywhere to put the snow. 
So this clause just states that if I have to bring in like a skid steer or something to move the snow banks to clear stuff out, that that is not included in the price and there will be an additional charge for that. But I haven't had to do that yet. I've come really close to having to do it. There's been a few times where I said, if we get one more snowfall this week, I'm going to have to bring something in. Um, but luckily I haven't had to do it yet. Then I just state that I'm going to carry liability auto and snowplow insurance for the duration of the contract. All right, this next section here talks about property damage and basically just says that um, if the customer or I notice something that I've damaged within 24 hours, it needs to be reported or that they could waive um, me from liability if they don't tell me about it. If they see it and they don't say anything and then they wait until like the spring, well, you did this during the winter. This basically says like, well, you didn't tell me about it, so I'm not liable because now I can't put it into my insurance because of statute limitations and all this kind of stuff. So not that I would do that. I just, it's a contract, so you have to cover everything you possibly can. Uh, limitation of liability. So this basically just talks about all the different things that I'm not liable for. Obviously, I'm not going to intentionally damage anything, but it is possible. So this just talks about some of that stuff. Damage to landscaping by piling of snow, damage to items that are snow covered or not visible, damage caused by equipment when tree, shrub, and sidewalk areas are not reasonably delineated due to snow accumulation, damage caused by customer moving and or removing marker stakes, which I added that clause in this year because of what I talked about earlier, personal injuries resulting from slip and fall accidents, and or acts of God, including but not limited to extraordinary weather conditions. Next is the hold harmless agreement, which is just some legal mumbo jumbo, which I don't understand, but the lawyer made me put that in there. Provision for default and cancellation just says anybody can cancel this with written notice. And the customer is responsible for all costs of services rendered up to the cancellation date. And that I am not obligated to issue refunds for services not rendered and I will assess this on a case-by-case -case basis. Severability just is basically in lawyer terms saying that if any one part of this contract is like invalid or void, as it says in here, then the rest of the contract is still valid other than that one little thing. The one little thing doesn't make the whole rest of the contract go away. Then I've got my additional notes section, which I can just handwrite in, like I was talking about, like with shoveling, I can handwrite that in there, any special things that I have to put in there. All right, this last section just says that the contract goes into effect once the contractor receives one signed copy and first payment. Send payment, if applicable, and signed contract before October 31st to business address right here. I've read and understand this contract and agree to abide by the terms listed and hereby enter into contract with business name for the purposes listed above. Obviously change this uh, business name out for your business name. Then we leave this blank and it's again red so that they hopefully see that and actually sign print and date. And then I sign print and date here. Now when I did these, I actually typed in my name and typed in the date. So it was just one less thing I had to do on every contract. So when it's all said and done, this thing is one page front and back. Um, it's very easy to read. It's Arial font, A-R-I-A-L, and it is size 10. So it's pretty small print, but it's still very easy to read. And again, if you want a copy of this contract so you can use it for your own or help reference some stuff or get some of this legal wordage, just let me know. Um, I'll put my email again down in the video description so that you can just send me an email and I'll send you a link to my Google Doc as a viewer and you can copy and paste and do whatever you want to do, or I can send you a PDF or a Word document or whatever you need. Again, please check with a lawyer to make sure that this all works for you and whatever. Just check with a lawyer. Don't just rely on me for this information. So if you got anything out of this video, give it a thumbs up down below and subscribe to the channel. And if you subscribe, click the notification bell right next to the subscribe button. Turn that to all. That way you can be notified when I release new videos. And if you're interested in more videos like this, you can check out these ones right here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video.